Uh, via telephone, we are joined by the House Majority Leader, Eric Halsoder. Eric, good morning to you. Hey, good morning. Sorry, I was just listening to the last segment just uh, very intently and uh, got busy and uh, forgot the time. So sorry. You were, I'm a little late. You were engrossed in the situation. <laughs> Well, I was engrossed, and also I have a project that I'm bidding on tomorrow, so I was looking over some details. So, you know, but, uh, for a retired HVAC guy, you sure do a lot of <laughs> HVAC work, Eric. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. Well, with all the heat, that's that's been the blessing. I mean, look, today is supposed to be 98 degrees, I think, 97 degrees. Yeah. So, yeah. So the heat is just wreaking havoc on pe people's uh, AC. Uh, units. I, so. I have a new AC unit, so I'm I'm in good shape right now. <laughs> yeah, you're in good shape. Yep, so yep, far, yep. thank so, you. Uh, yeah. So I wanted to talk to you about the uh, most recent revenue numbers for the month of August and ask you your thoughts on the math there and whether it's working out as to how you hoped it would. I know the governor acknowledged that the numbers were probably, while it was still a surplus, it was a smaller surplus than he was expecting. You're right. Uh, the surplus for the month of August was uh, 22 million, I believe. Uh, personal income tax is down a little bit with collections. We're down uh, 14 million. Uh, severance tax uh, is down a little bit. That's to be expected. It fluctuates a lot, uh, you know, a great deal. Uh, but your consumer sales tax was up roughly about 938 thousand, I believe. So for the year to date, so all indications we're still meeting targets. We're still meeting fairly close uh, the revenue estimates that were set. And keep in mind, revenue estimates are just that. They are future estimates that are done months and months ago. And uh, they're used for uh, estimating purposes to make key decisions. But right now, everything's going well. As you mentioned, uh, according to the September 1 Metro News article on it, overall tax collections for the month were $22.8 million above estimates. Uh, surplus was fueled by modest collection surpluses in the consumer sales tax and severance taxes. Personal income tax was $141 million, $14.6 million below the estimate. Uh, and the personal income tax, as you mentioned, it was 800 below estimate after two months. Uh, I know those are the estimates, but obviously the personal income tax collections are going to be lower because there was an income tax cut, Eric. But are you concerned that they're lower than you anticipated they would be? No, not really, because don't forget, we also made that tax cut retroactive. So um, obviously some of these estimates could be skewed a little bit, uh, but all indication, it should be relatively close to the uh, to where the estimates are moving forward or right there somewhere close. Uh, keep in mind, the uh, personal income tax cut was over uh, $250 million. Yes, and it, do you? We had talked before about the the next level, the other ten percent being triggered. Do you anticipate that still being triggered? I do, uh, but you won't. I don't think you'll see that until August of next year. As to when so, it would so, kick in. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Because remember how the bill was written: uh, the CPI numbers won't come out until about uh, July, and then revenue uh, has to take that CPI number. And, and, and put it into the formula to see, okay, what are the additional tax cuts up to 10%? And uh, you won't see any of that until probably August of next year. Matt Miller. You mentioned sales tax being up. Is that up as much as you might have anticipated with the income tax reduction? Clearly the thought is that people will have a little more money in their pocket and they'll go out and spend it. Well, the fiscal year estimate for uh, sales tax was right around two hundred fifty-one million seven hundred thousand. The fiscal year actual collections was two hundred fifty-two thousand six hundred thirty-eight thousand two hundred seventy-nine dollars. So it's fairly close to estimate, but uh, I mean, right now you, you still you're starting to see gas prices come down a little bit. You're starting to see, uh, yeah. I mean, unemployment right now is still low, relatively low in West Virginia. But uh, there are some top key, I think, um, you know, food costs are still fairly high. I just went to the grocery store this weekend, and it doesn't take long to spend a couple hundred dollars worth of food. Uh, I know gas prices uh, just – I was able to use my Martin point, my Martin's points to, to buy the gas down to three fifty five a gallon. But, you know, these are real issues that people thankfully do have a little bit more money in their pocket that can pay for some of these costs. 
Yeah, when you look at, at inflation, uh, how has it kind of impacted the budget and the numbers that, you know, you, you come up with as, hey, here's what we're projecting, but then inflation certainly has to have an impact? Oh, absolutely. Remember, during inflationary periods, the government does not lose money. The government, government actually makes more money. Uh, prices are higher. Uh, so in turn, you'll, you'll see higher sales tax use. Uh, or higher sales tax collections, I should say. So, all in all, uh, I think as as inflationary drops, inflation drops, you'll see a little bit closer return to somewhat of the estimates uh, that's predicted. Uh, remember, all these estimates, these revenue estimates, are just predictions. Now, but these predictions could also be used for any mid-year cuts or mid-year adjustments that uh, whoever the CEO or the governor, that's the governor is the chief chief executive officer of the state, uh, these uh, estimates are used sometimes to make those decisions that if we need to cut or or take a different course of action. Take us into those projections and kind of how they get laid out. Obviously, they've got to be based on the year prior and maybe even a handful of years. Uh, who kind of comes together and sets out all of those projections? Yes, the Revenue Secretary, of course, they're using mod modeling uh, data. They're also looking at prices, historic prices, um, you know, for in the energy sectors. Uh, they're also using a lot of data from previous years uh, as far as collections. And keep in mind, they also can predict some of these bumpy months. I mean, we do know that usually December is usually higher for sales tax collections because of Christmas time. But your January, your February months could be lower in sales tax collections, but your severance tax is higher because we're starting to really see the full effect of winter and, and, and the energy prices can go up. Uh, so they, they try to, you know, account. I've never actually sit down with them to see how they uh, do all of it, but uh, they do give us a uh, usually the first committee meeting or second committee meeting of finance. They uh, they kind of go over the projections. It gives us an opportunity to ask questions, but a lot of it's just all based off of prior years and uh, in historical data. Eric, what um, I mean, we've we've been on this big upturn. We've had, of course, the the big surpluses and stuff. Yes. What fiscally with the, the coming sessions, what fiscally do you think um, we need to do? What what does the legislature need to do fiscally to keep us on the right path so we so we don't veer off all these all the successes that we've had so we don't veer away from it? Well, number one, you have to make sure that you control the rate of spending, and and ways to do that is to continue the flatline budget. If we allow for runaway spending or pet projects it jeopardizes the personal income tax that we put in effect. And that's the last thing that I or anybody else would want to do. So it's uh, always a more cautious, more prudent approach to continue to to follow the flatline budget. And, and remember, revenues are growing by $150 million typically every year. There's always up to about a 5% growth. And with that personal income tax bill that was written, it does allow the state legislature to spend up to about 5% if there's key things that need to be done, like pay raises or any of that such. But uh, any big ticket item bills, you've got to be very cautious with. And uh, as always, just uh, manage and control your rate of spending. And, and, and Jonathan, to create, to continue to create that economy, that's going to allow risk takers to uh, take more risk and uh, hire more people and create more jobs. That's what really is the success to uh, uh, bringing in uh, these revenues. Yeah, the more jobs, the more uh, the more especially good paying jobs, the more people we have paying taxes here in the state and the more things the state absolutely. can do. Yep, absolutely. Eric Householder, our guest, he is the House Majority Leader, former uh, finance chairman uh, as well. And uh, Eric, when is the next interim session? Is that next week? It is. Uh, next Sunday, uh, 10th, 11th, and 12th, we'll be in Charleston. And what uh, mainly will you be discussing? Any idea yet? Well, every committee down there, uh, Rob, they have uh, different projects, different bills that they're working on. And we use this time during our interim session to uh, study uh, uh, topics. Uh, some I know finance, they're, they're meeting to just go over – It'll be a joint committee on finance. They'll, they'll review revenue numbers. They'll hear from the revenue secretary. 
they'll hear what projections that they see uh, for the next couple months. And uh, I know, I believe there's a speaker from Workforce West Virginia that's also going to be speaking for Joint Committee on Finance. But most of these committees, you know, they're using their time wisely to create these study topics that could turn into potential legislation. And uh, this is where we do most of our work before the legislative session begins in uh, January. What are your thoughts, if you're allowed to discuss it at this point, in regards to unemployment and the way it is set up in West Virginia in terms of duration, number of weeks, and, and how the whole process works? Yeah, yes. Uh, I, obviously, there's been a bill for the last two years that the legislative session tried to pass to bring this into uh, what I would call uh, standard with a lot of other states. I mean, right now... Um, we haven't been too successful on the House side. When I was the finance chair, I did get the bill out of finance committee. We got it down onto the House floor. Uh, it did uh, limit the number of weeks. Um, it did lower the rate. And uh, we got it as far as second reading, and then it got parked on House calendar and never went any farther. Uh, this past session, the Senate did a great job getting the bill out again. Uh, we got it over to the House side, and uh, it didn't go anywhere. But uh, – yeah, we're going to need unemployment reform. I'm all in favor of reducing the weeks. Uh, keep in mind, it is a safety net, and it should be a safety net. But also, if you're an able-bodied adult and you're able to find work, you should go back to work. It may not be the uh, it may not be the exact ideal ideal conditions that you're looking for, but uh, overall, you know, we've all said a good-paying job, and working is a uh, a sound way to keep a sound mind as well. So, Eric, how many uh, how many weeks do you want to see it drop down to? I'm fine with 16 or 20 weeks or less. Um, but uh, right now, there's not an appetite to go that low. Uh, some people want to see it as high as 26, 28. Maybe the sweet spot could be right around 22 weeks. But uh, right now, it's just it's we're all. I can tell you on the House side, it's the, the general consensus is basically all over the map. Are there? And, oh, I'm sorry. In those sort of well, in those things, are there provisions to where if somebody has extraordinary circumstances to ask for more weeks still, or is that just you'd like to see just a flat amount? Well, it, it's it's got to be an average because there are some counties, and and, we'll, and for instance, we'll use the county where uh, the speakers from Clay County. You know, you're kind of lock, landlocked. You don't have the capability or the ability like we have in the panhandle where, you know, uh, we could easily go into Maryland or Virginia or some other area to find a uh, you know, gainful employment. Uh, but uh, Clay County is usually leading. They're one of the counties with the highest unemployment rates. Uh, they're up around 14 percent most of the time at times where we could be in, in the eastern panhandle down around 3, 4, 5 percent. So there has to be some concessions for those areas, and, and, and I think most of us understand that. But uh, in order to find that common ground, that's what we're trying to work on. Is that is is, is coming up with sort of a staggered schedule based on the unemployment rate in a certain county? I mean, is that is is that something that's difficult to put together as locality pay for teachers, or is that something that people are more more apt to look at? No, it can be, but people are. I think people would be open to the suggestion. Right now, we were trying to figure out. I know uh, Marty Gearhart, uh, the uh, whip majority whip from uh, Mercer County, we whipped it several different ways to try to get some consensus on what we could get passed so we could uh, let the Senate know, hey, this is where we're at. Is this something that you could find amenable to to reach some you know level that we could get something across the finish line? But um, Right now, we're just not there in the House. And particularly, uh, I think what's driving this equation is mostly southern West Virginia. And, um, you know, I, I think a lot of counties in southern West Virginia are concerned that, um, hey, look, you know, 16, 20 weeks, that's, that's not enough time to allow us to find another job. But, but keep in mind, um, you know, the employee trust fund with the unemployment trust fund, I should say, you know, by by us not passing this bill, actually you've seen a lot of um, most small businesses throughout the state of West Virginia have, have received a tax increase. 
Uh, so we, we need to do something. And uh, so everybody's uh, their, um I forget the name, but right, because it's been a while since I've been in business, but uh, it, your unemployment rate normally will go up if you're, um, you know, if you're laying off people or having huge turnover. But that rate is usually on the first $12,000 of wages. Uh, most people, most small businesses in June of this year have saw an increase in that taxable rate uh, because the legislature failed to get something across the line to reform unemployment. Eric, according to a West Virginia Metro News poll, an article by Brad McElhaney, 44% mm -hmm. of West Virginians uh, effectively feel the state's economy is not headed in the right direction. Have you seen that article? I did. I briefly read it over the weekend, and a lot of that is probably being uh, dictated by the national trends that we're all seeing, that we're all feeling. But one could also say, hey, look, the unemployment rate in West Virginia is low. Uh, people are still working. Um, so at all indications right now, um, I mean, I think a lot of those national issues are driving the, uh, the discussion with why they see the economy is not looking very well. Eric, some of that may come as well from the flatline budgets that, that you even mentioned earlier. And there are some who say the flatline budget really leaves certain services that are needed across our state not being filled or fulfilled in the way that they should be. How do you answer that? Well, it's the exact opposite argument that you hear that we need to continue to spend more and more money. And that's what we've done for years on end. Um, I mean, the flatline budget has only been implemented for four years now, and we continue, as I've stated many times on this radio station, if you believe in smaller, limited government, the flatline budget will allow you to exceed that. Um, keep in mind, we are still funding all necessary services. Uh, most of our uh, big-ticket items uh, we are funding each and every year. We're funding over a billion dollars in the highway. Uh, $2 billion into DHHR, $2 billion into education. So we're funding all the necessary requirements. But uh, as the economy starts to grow, you have two conditions that could happen. One, you could continue to put the money in the budget. And when you do that, agencies are going to spend more and more of your hard-earned tax dollar. But if you're of the belief that uh, you believe in smaller limited government and that uh, here's an opportunity to return the money back to the hard-earned uh, taxpayers through tax cuts. Uh, keep in mind, we have $1.1 billion in our rainy day fund. So, I mean, I think the uh, the taxpayers have contributed a lot. But, um, yeah, the argument that you just made to me is the same argument to spend more money. So, The uh, article also shows the workforce participation rate in West Virginia as a concern, Eric, one of the lowest in the country at 54.7%. How do you rectify that? You have to rectify it by creating more jobs and getting a younger workforce in. There's not many opportunities in southern West Virginia besides the energy sector, and I don't know that you're ever going to increase that. Uh, we're at, um, areas of the state, like the middle of the state, the rest of us, we're going to have to continue on with job creation. All things are, you know, we're firing on all cylinders in Berkeley. We're, we're more and more new businesses moving in in, in the eastern panhandle. And we're going to continue to be the lead, to be the leader. Uh, final question for uh, Eric, Jonathan, or Matt. Anything that you have that you didn't answer yet? You, I'm just I'm, I'm hearing you, and you're talking there, obviously, <laughs> yeah. about the growth and the things that are happening in Berkeley County. How much more are we seeing that in some of the more impoverished areas of our state? You're not seeing very much. Yeah. I know the Senate President and others have said that. Uh, you know, in order to turn southern West Virginia around, you may see – I mean, we're an energy-producing state. I know uh, the governor and others have been in – our economic development team have been in contact with uh, some new emerging technology with small-cell nuclear. Uh, so, you know, some of these uh, ideas are going to have to come forth to maybe help out the southern part of the state. But uh, right now we're going to continue to mine coal. It drill for natural gas, and uh, that's that's what we've done for years and throughout the middle part of the state and southern and southern West Virginia. And um, other than that, that's all I see. 
All right, Eric, I'll keep this general. There's uh, a few questions have showed up in our comments section, and that is in regards to the future of Eric Householder. You can answer that question any way you like. Okay. Well, if you want to hear about the future of Eric Householder, I would invite you to come over to the Holiday Inn this Friday at noon, and you'll get that opportunity to hear what's on my plate Soup. Are you serving any food over there? Will there be other things on the plates? <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of plates. There will be a pitcher of water on, on everyone's table. Mm. That? Sustenance. you got to nice. have water to live. Yes. <laughs> hey, Eric, sure. thanks. I appreciate your time and sense yep. of humor, sir. Yeah, we'll see you guys. Bye. That is the House Majority Leader, Delegate Eric Householder.